uh, today we're going to go back to what I normally do. And this uh, was occasioned by an article done by Foreign Affairs, published in Foreign Affairs uh, Journal last September, September uh, 2015. It was on the Russian uh, political theorist uh, Ivan Ilin, a 20th century uh, so-called white immigrant writer. He was both a nationalist and a, a monarchist. Um, but most importantly, the, the foundation of it all for him was that he was a Hegelian. And the first time I came across um, uh, that writer was uh, because I've, I've been a Hegelian my entire life. I went from Plato to Christianity to Hegel and then spent quite a, quite a while synthesizing all of that in the Russian experience. It actually really works very well. And Ivan Ilin is the perfect person because he has uh, several works bringing out the uh, nationalist and Christian elements of Hegel's uh, social thought and, and his metaphysics in particular. I've always thought that Hegel is um, you know, the ultimate, uh, the most sophisticated of all the nationalist writers, all the communitarian writers, that he would be today, you know, for lack of a better phrase, on the far right of the political spectrum. Uh, but because of his butchery by Karl Marx, he's been associated with the left. Um, the problem with Hegel is that he's almost impossible to read, um, even in the best of translations. You really have to know your um, 17th century German philosophy and the history of philosophy in general before you could even dare to read the introduction. And even then, uh, you find yourself just throwing it, throwing it against the wall because it is so impossibly difficult. Why he writes like this has been, been an irritant uh, to me. Um, and normally, that kind of dense writing is not a problem for me. Uh, in fact, I, I, I tend to it, even the way, I, the way I speak. But Hegel, just when I first uh, uh, dealt with him in college, I, I, I couldn't tell whether I was stupid or he was just a, a lunatic. Uh, studying Hegel, your, your best bet is to read secondary literature first. You have to know Immanuel Kant very well. Then you read the secondary literature. This is the one time where reading the secondary literature is very important. You have to know the basics, and most importantly, you have to know the fact that he's using a technical vocabulary. A lot of the words that he uses are defined um, idiosyncratically by him. Unless you know that, you're going to think that he's using these words uh, in English translation or in the original German uh, in a normal sense, and he almost never does. He never is using those in, in a normal sense, and so you end up having no idea what he's talking about. The problem when you have someone that dense and that difficult is that a lot of people um, will pretend to know about him and they'll assume that there's pretty much no one who could refute them and so they could say whatever they want. And they believe that the dialectics is, is something that is sinister, uh, something like that. They, they don't understand it. Uh, same thing, when you know, Plato is, is a much better writer but he is the, he is, and he is much simpler, but that's deceptive. For Plato, you have to go deep into the literature because he's writing as, a, as a, almost as a, a literary figure. Uh, but Hegel is writing as a professional philosopher, uh, someone coming out of the, the Kantian school and, and, um, and uh, uh, teasing out both the positive and negatives of, of his point of view. So if you don't know Kant, Hegel's meaningless. If you don't know his technical vocabulary, Hegel's meaningless. If you don't know um, Prussian political history, he's really meaningless. But I decided many years ago uh, mostly in grad school, that I was going to master this man as much as I possibly could. And I read Terry Pinker and a lot of these guys um, who were well-known in the modern secondary uh, literature. I got the vocabulary down, and then I went first to the Knox translation of the philosophy of right, which is much easier to read. And then finally, I, ta I tackled both the logic and the phenomenology. And it was a very painful experience. It really, it took me, you know, at the time, for 1994, 95, it gave me two pages at a sitting I was able to get through. Um, reading an English translation, maybe two or three pages at a sitting. I took a lot of notes. I tried to connect him back to Kant, but there really comes a time where I just don't know, and there's certain sections in there that not just me, but lots of other people have no idea what he's talking about. Um, he just goes off and this is very, uh, I believe that he has the longest sentence in the history of philosophy. It's 42 pages. I believe it's in the, the logic, volume two of the logic. Uh, and that gets cleaned up in the English translation. But you know, that's what kind of a writer he was. 
Now, with um, and that's, that's how I got into Ilin, and it's one of the reasons I got into to Russian philosophy. Because Ilin was a follower of Hegel, and he believed that Hegel was essentially a nationalist and royalist figure, which he's correct on. And so he has several commentaries on Hegel that most people can't read. Um, and uh, but because you know their, their ignorance of, of Ilin, their ignorance of Russian politics, and their ignorance of Hegel, most certainly, you can be forgiven uh, for the ignorance of Hegel. Most people, most philosophers, are ignorant of Hegel. So um, Ivan Ilin is both a nationalist and a royalist. His foundation is both in the Orthodox Church and in um, in, in George William Frederick Hegel. The uh, foreign affairs piece from September um, is just you know, these people were paid to, again to throw throw another uh, attack at Vladimir Putin. They claim that Ilin is Putin's philosopher. Now I've read everything that that man has ever uttered, ever scribbled. Um, you know his his love notes in third grade. I've read everything this man has, and I've never come across him mentioning Ivan Ilin ever once. Maybe I missed it. I don't know. But again, Johnson's Law is very important. If you don't know, and a handful of people in the West who would know about this, they can say whatever they want, and most people are not going to be able to refute them. Well, I'm going to do that here. Um, unlike Hegel, uh, Ilin is a, um, a very good writer. And he is, if you know the terminology and if you know uh, the basic um, uh, arguments of the of the right wing of the white movement uh, in Russian history, and keep in mind that, that the white movement was not, I mean, only a tiny minority were royalists. Many, but not all, were nationalists. And remember, the white movement viewed itself as the armed wing of the provisional government. Most of the leadership was anti-royal. You know, Dunikin, for example, was vehemently anti-royal. I have his his uh, memoir right in front of me. The whites were not, you know, they, they were the good guys only when compared to the Bolsheviks. And it's a total lack of unity and their, you know, their essential liberal background that lost in the war. This kind of, you know, total lack of any ideological backbone. But if you were anti-communist, you had to throw your lot in with the whites. There was no other choice. And they acted as this big umbrella organization for all, you know, anti-Bolshevik forces, including socialists, those on the far left who were opposed to the Bolshevik idea. So Ivan Alin represents a minority in the white movement, but already, you know, these authors in foreign affairs refer to him as, you know, a white emigre author, um, completely ignorant of the fact that the white movement was generally not um, uh, on what we would call the far right of the political spectrum. They were, they were liberals, generally speaking, and they viewed themselves as followers of Kerensky and the provisional government. That was at least their formal legal reason for existing. And the leadership, generally speaking, followed that line, although there were always factions within it that had a tendency to be more royalist, uh, more ethno-nationalist, more religious, but that was a relatively small minority. So right off the bat, these guys make error after error after error. There's not a factual claim in the whole article. These men clearly never read them. There's a lot of people who criticize the neoconservatism. They talk about Leo Strauss. And Leo Strauss is extremely dense. He's very hard to read. And I know that these people have never read him. And they, they impute to him all kinds of nasty things that he never said. This happens quite often. Um, and uh, since there's not a whole lot of people who know how to refute that, they can say whatever they want. And that's the situation here. It's a hatchet job. These guys probably have never read Ivan Illin at all. I know my friend uh, Mark Hackard has done some very nice translations of him. And as far as I know, that's the only uh, English translations of Elin that I've ever come across. That might happen um, as soon, or I might have missed it. I don't know. But everything, uh, I've read all of Elin's political writings uh, in the original because I think that's all there is. Uh, my translation skills are okay. They're not great. Um, I've done it in the past. I've published some of them in the past, but I'm very insecure about it. Um, I, I, you know, I'm very self, I'm self-taught in that uh, area um, uh, because I had no choice. Most of that material has not been translated, and there's very good reason why it hasn't been translated. Ivan Ilin, from a, a, a nationalist point of view, no matter what background you are, is an extremely approachable, extremely attractive writer. Um, the authors of that uh, foreign affairs piece say that he was pro-Hitler, which is unsurprising. He was nothing of the kind. He condemned Hitler. They claim that he was a Eurasianist. Because that's kind of a, a buzzword with these people who pretend to know something about it. They don't even define the word Eurasianism properly. But uh, Ilin was not one. 
And the fact that he was um, spent a lot of time in Berlin, uh, educated there, and was a Hegelian suggests that he was not a Eurasianist. Um, he had a Western tendency, but and this is something I should clear up right now. When your typical Russian nationalist refers to the West, especially today, he's referring to liberalism, capitalism, liberal democracy, that kind of thing. He's talking about NATO and, and the IMF. He's not talking about the Middle Ages. He's not talking about Plato and Aristotle. Um, you know, in that sense, you know, Russia is much the heir to Plato and Aristotle as anybody else is. Um, because Byzantium is the, the society that maintained their writings, uh, not the West. So we need to be careful there. Um, it, often in, in the religious realm, when they refer to the West, they're referring to either Roman Catholics or Protestants. But rarely is Western civilization as such um, being referred to when they use the, the word the, the West. Uh, Dugan has been misinterpreted by certain nationalists in America because he you know, wants to destroy the West. And they've taken that to mean they want to destroy Europe and, and white people and all that stuff. And that's not the case. So be very careful. And I think maybe using that term is very sloppy anymore. Um, be careful when they use phrases like that, words like that, because they're, they're referring to very specific things. You know, the phrase Western civilization is almost completely meaningless to me. You know, you can't put the Enlightenment, for example, the Industrial Revolution and Middle Ages in the same category. They contradict in every area. So if you're using the phrase Western civilization, tell me what you mean. Is it Greece and Rome? Is it the Middle Ages? Is it, you know, St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas? Is it um, Francis Bacon? You know, it, you know, all of this, but these people have nothing in common. The entire Renaissance and Enlightenment came into, at least intellectually speaking, came into existence as a, uh, um, a negation of the Middle Ages, of a negation of, of Aristotle. Aristotle was the enemy, and uh, the rise of nominalism was a negation of pretty much everything. So um, these terms, when they're used by, including people like Yulin, uh, Dugan, they're very, very easy to misinterpret, and people have a tendency to react emotionally and emotions take over often when they don't know the topic area very well. Um, my field is one that attracts a lot of amateurs. And amateurs are okay. I mean, these are the people who buy my books. I mean, we need them. Um, but the problem is that sometimes they believe that they can have authoritative opinions. And on you know, kind of arcane topics that only specialists deal with. And you know, often their heart is in the right place. But they just don't understand that there's so much out there that they don't even know exists. But the overwhelming majority of the Russian intellectual tradition has never been translated, which is what forced me to learn the language uh, many years ago in the first place. Um, actually, learned, I learned Ukrainian first, and everything kind of fell in from that. Um, I could read it, but I can't speak it. In fact, I've never even heard most of these things ever pronounced before. Uh, I just see it as, as words on a page, and when I translate, it's just a matter of interpreting the symbols. It's like decoding rather than a form of communication. But hearing these things spoken to me, I don't know what you're talking about. I just see them as, as, as symbols on a page. That's my approach to the thing. To, to know how to speak it, you have to live there. You have to be saturated with it all the time. And that's never going to happen for me. Um, as a historian, I have no desire to go to Russia unless you could create a time machine to bring me back to the 18th century. That Then, you know, I'd be happy. But right now, there's nothing in particular that attracts me about it. Uh, and um, there aren't enough drugs on the planet to get me in an airplane for 13 hours. So um, Ivan Alin, um, like Alexander Dugan, misinterpreted uh, somehow because they're on the right of the political spectrum in general. They're associated in the, in the West with everything Ibis, liberals, uh, socialists, conservatives. Um, everything Russian is a bit sinister. And um, the right is something to be assaulted and to be hated. Um, but Alin is extremely valuable because he combines the best of Western nationalism, conservatism, especially Hegel and Plato on the one hand with the Russian experience on the other. So he's one of these guys that, um, you know, not, he's not really a Slavophile uh, uh, in the, with the capital S, you know, the philosophical movement, because he is very interested in, and I think, I think the Slavophiles misinterpreted Hegel. Um, and, um, but Elin saw what I saw, and I couldn't believe this for the first time, I'm reading somebody who saw in Hegel what I saw. I never read anybody 
maybe maybe Boston Cat. Maybe it's the only other other person who saw that Hegel is a nationalist royalist uh, figure, a figure on the right of the political spectrum, and certainly having very little in common um, with the left. In fact, um, I've always wondered why Edmund Burke got that role as being the philosopher of the. He's not even a philosopher. Uh, Hegel's far more interesting and far more thorough, and far more theoretical. And uh, Burke was was more pragmatic. Anyway, the philosophy of uh, Ivan Lillian is spread out over a number of books and a whole bunch of articles. His entire collected works, which I've been through, are available online, numerous Russian places. Uh, it's all public uh, domain. And um, I, I started off by going through the books first, then realized that a lot of the essays were already uh, in the books I read. The rest of the essays that were not uh, published in the books, that just stood on their own, were uh, ways I could fill in any gaps in my understanding. And that's usually how it works. The first concept, Elin and Hegel, is that the family is the unit. Now, people say that all the time without realizing what they mean. It's not the individual. The individual is a fiction. It's an abstraction. An individual by himself would be dead in a few hours. The family is a unit where individuals... Um, develop individuality only in the unit, only within the, the society. The individual is secondary. The individual only is only exists at all because of the family and the broader society. It means that cooperation and community come first, and the individual is parasitic on that. Uh, for him, the nation, like most nationalists, and when I say nationalist, I'm referring to the ethnic group, ethno-nationalists, the family and the ethnic group are related. Whether they're, I mean, they're biologically related in the sense that people normally marry those speaking their language, so they're they're inbred in that sense, but also in a in a more spiritual sense, in in the fact that they have a similar faith, similar way of life, and similar experiences. The best part of, of the nation and how it resembles family is what a nation has been through. Nations that have been uh, colonized. Uh, that they've experienced attempts to genocide, uh, to destroy them, to, uh, to, to be wiped out of existence, um, exploited, assaulted, constant warfare, instability. That builds a very strong, cohesive nation. Because the only way that these people survive is by hanging together. And the traditions and folkways that come out of that, that is the nation. Uh, structures of survival is a term that I, the phrase that I coined many years ago, uh, that gets plagiarized once in a while. Uh, like most of my stuff is, um, but you know the nation for me is that which suffering uh, forces people to do to survive. Those mindsets, those institutions, those ways of thinking—that's what a nation is, because this is what under stress. When you want to define something, you don't define it when it's at peace. And usually, scientists they they want to understand something, they put it under great stress, they they heat it up, they they freeze it, they they, they break it. Um, they don't look at it just in a stagnant way. And same thing for individuals. You don't understand individuals when things are going well. You understand individuals when things are going horribly. How do they, how do they compensate? How do they deal with this kind of suffering? That's when you come to know someone. And the nation comes into existence for this very same reason. The nation is these structures of survival, these structures that exist um, because the nation has suffered. Solidarity comes from suffering. Citizenship and the public interest are one and the same thing, but understand that there is no way in his mind, that there is no way that self-interest, however you want to define it, in a Marxist sense, in a capitalist sense, um, you know, in a utilitarian sense, self-interest can never be the foundation for any nation, for any society at all. There is no universal understanding of, of mankind. The two entities are the nation as the ethnic unit and the religious unit on the one side, and the state on the other. The two of them are supposed to cooperate. The state only really matters and only has legitimacy to the extent that it coheres and arises from the nation and its experiences. Totalitarianism, statism, that kind of authoritarianism where the state seems to be functioning only for itself in its own interest. Totalitar totalitarianism comes into existence when the state is long since alienated from the nation, has nothing to do with the nation, and exists as an alien imposition. So looking at this, remember, in, in the 20s, there was no one 
in, in, in the West or the East who thought that the USSR was anything but a Jewish ethnic experiment. Everyone, it doesn't matter what their political background was, everyone saw the USSR at the time as Jewish. It was a Jewish ethnic movement. Um, you know, the liberals, conservatives in the West, um, the, the congressional hearings about Bolshevism, that's what they came, uh, everyone believed this. Only in the last, you know, 40 years has it become even illegal in some places to refer to the USSR as, as a Jewish idea. But for a long time, uh, even under Stalin, it's a myth, Stalin was not an anti-Semite, he was very philo-Semitic. Um, but for Elin, the USSR was the ultimate example of this. This Jewish urban elite didn't even speak Russian, hated Russians, had nothing to do with the, the villagers, the countryside, the church, anything that was actually Russian. They viewed themselves as aliens, were ruling an entire country. The state had nothing to do with the nation at all. The state existed to transfer the wealth of the people to these Jewish party members. And this Jewish elite continued to run, especially the police agencies and the gulag camps. Unlike in the West, you know, in the U.S. it's very rare to find Jews in, in uh, the army or Jews in, in police. But when it came to killing Christians, they're everywhere. And um, the Jews were such a tiny minority in the Soviet Union, and yet they dominated the police services, the secret services, um, the state apparatus in general. Um, one of the important central concepts in Ivan Lin's thinking is the definition of freedom. The word freedom in, in the West um, has been butchered to the point where it now almost means the opposite of what it originally was me meant, to, meant to be. Um, the word that we should use, I think, that would make better sense is autonomy rather than freedom. In the West, there's a tendency to believe that freedom refers to the ability to do whatever you want, that there is a lack of external restraint, and so it comes down to being able to act arbitrarily, having no reason to act the way you do, uh, because there can be no causality. There's just freedom to do whatever you want. And that's somehow a good thing. I don't see how that's a good thing at all. It's too abstract. Well, freedom to, you know, you talk about freedom. Freedom to do what? You know, what are you going to do with this, with this uh, lack of external restraint? There's nothing good about that. It depends what you're going to do with it. Uh, autonomy makes more sense because the way that uh, Elin and so many, Solzhenitsyn, so many uh, uh, conservatives over the years have defined it, it refers to the lack of internal restraint. And there we're talking about appetites, especially self-interest. Autonomy, the way you, the, the word freedom should be used is the freedom from appetites, the freedom from greed and anger, the thing that distort perception distort the very world around us. Uh, these passions, uh, greed, lust, you know, um, they end up taking over the mind and they project themselves onto the world. This is one of the central aspects of human nature. The world begins taking on the form of whatever it is you're obsessed with. And the businessman doesn't see people. He might see customers, um, uh, people to exploit. He looks at the natural world and sees, you know, parking lots, and lumber and, and you know he doesn't see nature he sees you know when, when you really get that deep into the obsession when this really drives you you begin seeing the world in, in a completely distorted way freedom is autonomy it's the lack of internal restraint this is the same concept of self-government self-government is not just for you know independence of a nation but also how individuals are to function um, Self-government independence means and implies that there is nothing internally. There's no, nothing driving you. The concept of a passion and an appetite, it, the very root of these terms, is that it's something that happens to you. You're not in control of it. Uh, it controls you. Freedom is perfectly the concept of freedom that, that most people use in the conversational definition. It's fully consistent with being you know, obsessed with, with, with greed or whatever it is that you want, power. So long as there's no external restraint, you can do whatever you want. But that's a meaningless concept. It's, it's useless. And it's very new. You know, as the Western world has decayed into nothing, um, words like freedom have lost all of their meaning. Autonomy, self-government, the lack of internal restraint is what matters. When you look at the world without self-interest, without this drive for power, for, self, for, for esteem, for recognition, you see the world differently. It's my opinion that truth is not very hard to find on these issues. The key is, and it's very hard, 
is to eliminate anything in your mind that might keep you from recognizing it. If you're obsessed with power, if you're obsessed with money, with women, with, with an ideological movement, something that just overtakes you and runs your life, you end up having to force everything into that mold. And you will distort things, not realizing that you're doing it, because you have to force it all into that uh, pre-existing uh, framework. If you can eliminate that, if you can eliminate all self-interest, to be able to catch yourself when you begin thinking that, that you're, you're, you're developing opinions because it's in your interest to do so, the minute and, and trying to catch yourself, um, uh, and if you do that, the chances of you coming to the truth are very, very good. It's been something that I've tried to do personally. It's extremely difficult. Try to separate yourself from self-interest. This is why Plato's guardian class could have no families. They could have no property. The concept is if they those things distort the world, you're partial. You're partial to what's your own, your own family, your own uh, home and, and, and lands. Um, that will distort how you view the world because you will be partial to yourself. Um, these kind of guardian classes from Plato on up uh, have never been allowed. Uh, the Janissary Corps in, in, in Turkey. So many of these elite uh, classes were never allowed to have families or property of any kind. They needed to be as autonomous as possible. They needed to worry about truth and the common good. And the best way to do that is to make sure that they're autonomous. They're not free in the modern sense of the word, but they're certainly autonomous and they're self-governing. Even his definition of socialism, you know, it's such a tragedy that the Rothschild family financed Marx and, and part of what they were doing, you know, socialism has always been um, about corporate capital, especially finance capital. It's never, especially in the Soviet Union, had nothing to do with labor. I'm, I'm still, you know, 20 years later, still trying to find something positive they ever did for labor, for workers. I can't find a thing. They were viciously exploited throughout the Soviet Union, the, the existence of the USSR. Uh, labor had nothing to do with um, Soviet policy. Um, Socialism, though, prior to that, was mostly a Christian idealistic notion. Uh, turning it into a, an anti-religious materialist idea, this is what came out of Rothschild money pouring into Marx's movement. And Karl Marx was able to stomp on all other forms of socialism, different kinds of anarchism, which were uh, all over the place. Uh, uh, most conservatism was socialist in that sense. It was mostly idealistic and spiritual. Uh, only, you know, Marx and, and um, uh, uh, um, his followers and later on Bukhar and people like this turned it into a materialist, very crude, uh, very kind of a stupid idea. Because no one could be a consistent materialist and make any sense out of anything. Um, the Trinity is another foundation because it does act like a family. We even use terms like you know father and son. Uh, for him, there is three things: a trinity of things, or any question. There is material the actual facts of the case, the, the tangible reality. There's the intellectual or the logical, but then there's the spiritual. Spiritual is above all of that. Spiritual is what encapsulates everything that provides the final purpose and the final origin, which are really one and the same thing, uh, especially in the Christian mind. The creation and the final end of all things is end up going in the same place and has the same purpose. Though the intellectual is one step below that. It has to do with the practical intellect rather than the final end of mankind. Now, the nations um, partake of all three. Uh, the nation comes into existence from several factors, ideally speaking. Um, the topography, the geography of a certain area. Uh, is it close to water? Is it mountainous? Is it, is it flat? Is you know, uh, what the temperature is? These things have a lot to do with creating a, a people. The topography, the general, uh, the seasons, um, is it harsh? Is it easy? You know, living in the far north is, is far more difficult than, than, lead, than living in, in, in southern Europe or, or parts of Africa, uh, wherever it's, it's warm all the time. Uh, the nature of the population itself, how diverse are they? People generally marry um, those who look like them and who talk like them. People speaking different languages can't even communicate, let alone get married and have children. So nations are born, have this biological connection. Also, the nature of the classes. You know, there's always classes, whether it be uh, intellectually or in terms of function or in terms of income. These exist before anything. 
Uh, are there great inequalities? Are people more equal? How are things being organized? The resources available to them um, are, you know, like, like old Japan uh, was essentially rock sticking up out of the water. Their resources were very weak, and so they always had to look outward to find resources elsewhere. Rather than a country like Russia that had everything, or the U.S., that had everything it needed internally. And then what developed slowly but surely, the nature of the law, the culture, um, all of these things interacting with one another, plus the simple historical experiences. Do they have a lot of violent neighbors? Um, are, are they in a, in a you know, like really rough location, uh, like in the Balkans, you know, where you're crisscrossing armies all the time, great powers constantly seeking to manipulate you? Uh, the U.S. was formed kind of in, in a sense that they were protected. There were two oceans, and outside of the Indians, um, there was no one to threaten them. They could develop a very different kind of society that way. This is extremely important. Um, societies that are colonized and live under a foreign occupation for a long time develop very differently than societies that have been free for a long time. So in Africa, Ethiopia was never a, a, a colony. In fact, it was an empire, a colonizer. Uh, they have a very different point of view in terms of what Africa is uh, versus uh, the rest of Africa, the rest of sub-Saharan Africa that have been a colony of one or another of the great powers. Very different groups of people. Um, these, in general, is what creates uh, the national organism. It what creates the ethnic group. And none of them really matter without communication. Now, when I say a common language, we're not normally referring to just words and syntax and definitions. We're referring to everything that has to do with communication. All the folk ways, all the ways that people, the way that our body posture, um, the way that we, we greet one another, all of these little things taken together is pretty much our entire lives. Most of it is unwritten and unspoken. Most communication is nonverbal. Um, this is something that has to be in place before any cooperation can exist. If you don't speak the same language, if you don't have the same faith, if you believe in different things, especially in a fundamental way, you can't deal with one another. If you're not speaking the same language uh, in both the literal and the figurative sense of the word, there can't be a nation, there can't be a society. Um, the twisted thing that we're living with in, in 2016 America is that the regime is actually demanding that the basic fundamental elements of nationhood be removed from the U.S. and different peoples speaking different languages have nothing in common with one another, better at the point of a gun, better cooperate, which is impossible. Well, that kind of chaos, uh, the only group that is going to win is the group that is the most cohesive, that has the most resources, that is the most cohesive, and that is the Jews. However you want to, you know, many years ago, when I came across this for the first time, I resisted it. I, I, I came from a Jewish neighborhood. I, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to believe it. It was so, it cost so much, such a sacrifice to even bring it up in conversation. But I couldn't stop it anymore. I came across it over and over and over again. And then Jewish hostility was so vicious, even bringing it up towards me, even people who I've known for a long time knew there was something there. So the concept of, of, of Jewish control is simply that Jews are the most cohesive element with tremendous resources. And they promote a total lack of cohesion everywhere else. The more, the more chaotic a society, the less it resembles a nation, the more strong, the more powerful, the more influential that very cohesive group will become. But it can't just be any cohesive group. It's got to be a cohesive group that has money and that has an ideology behind it, like the Talmud, that justifies this dominance. I'm convinced that, that the Khazars, that King Bulan went to Judaism. I mean, there are other reasons, but one of them is that it justified slavery. It was a slave trading society. Judaism uh, permitted slavery to this very day, so long as the slaves aren't, aren't uh, Judaic. Uh, or even among the, Jew, the Jews, if they're enemies of the Jews. Uh, but it justified slavery explicitly. So if you're a slaveholding society, uh, Judaism is certainly a very attractive, um, a very attractive uh, option, especially when, you know, Khazaria was surrounded by uh, pagan, Islamic, and Christian elements. Christianity or Islam would have made a lot more sense in terms of building a commercial empire um, than Judaism. And it's such a unique situation because Jews rarely uh, want converts. 
um, because it's an ethnic group, uh, far more than it's a religion. I mean, there are very few religious Jews left anymore, uh, but it doesn't mean they're, they're, they're any less Jewish. The law of return in, in, um, in Israel is purely matrilinear, uh, or at least there has to be one Jewish grandparent, but normally it's matrilinear. It is done in racial um, uh, terms, in terms of your descendants, uh, where you come from, not in terms of religion. So by the very structure of Israeli society, it is a, a race or at least an ethnic group bound together by a language that kind of had to artificially uh, be resuscitated. That is Hebrew. Now, he is a royalist. And the state, uh, to truly be a state, has to have the personal element. This is something very Hegelian. It can't just be seen as a machine. The crown, a monarch, sees society as a spiritual element. It sees it uh, subspecies eternus, in the light of eternity, uh, under the concept, under, under the archetype of eternity. It sees society not just as a, a set of consumers or a set of voters, a utilitarian, pragmatic way. It sees them as spiritual beings, beings whose souls are more important than their bodies. And only monarchy has had a tendency, no matter where you go in the world, monarchy is always the most religious and spiritual element, uh, even, in the, even in the Far East. Monarchy only makes sense if it is deeply spiritual and religious, even more so than it is a form of state. Um, you take uh, the intro to political theory classes in college, uh, idiot professor will tell you that Hobbes Leviathan is, is, a, is a royalist tract. I've, I've heard that a million times, and it shows that the political theorists need to get another job, because you can't be a royalist if you're secular. Hobbes was a materialist. He believed the people are just matter in motion, clashing together, and the, the state, the Leviathan, which doesn't have to be a monarch, by the way. Uh, people just kind of envision it that way, but it couldn't be anything. Um, is able to force them apart from one another. It's just Newtonian physics, in essence. That is not royalism. Royalism has to be a spiritual and traditional, or it doesn't make any sense. And to a great extent, although with some exceptions, like, you know, the Habsburgs, it has to be ethnic. You know, the, the royal family is, and you see them in, in their full dress, Every little thing, every little symbol, every little color has some meaning in the history of a people. When, when, a, when a monarch is in full uh, dress regalia, it has the entire history of the nation um, summarized on him. Today, people have no idea what that even means, so it just looks like, you know, you know they, they just see it as, as a waste of money. You know, they're so stupid, they're so anomalous, uh, they don't know what anything means. They have no idea of history or anything, and so they look at it, something like that, and they don't know what they're looking at. They look at a painting, and they have no idea what the artist is trying to get across. Because they only think in pragmatic, nominalist, uh, simple terms, and they cannot see anything else. That's yet another form of how um, uh, decay, uh, obsessions, pathology, projects itself onto the world. Medieval man would be able to, even if they were illiterate, illiteracy did not mean stupidity, not, not by a long shot. It meant they had a tremendous memory. Um, but the point is, medieval man could see these symbols and instinctively know what they are and know the, the arcane nature of these things. Even if they couldn't express it very well, they knew what it was. They were far better off than the typical intellectual of today who was a complete disaster. Monarch is important also because it comes from a family. It needn't be hereditary, although it can be, um, but there, oh, there's also the family. There's always a royal family. It's not just some dictator that pops up out of nowhere. Um, and the monarch is, in his mind, always aware of suffering and pain. So our Nicholas II knew what was going to happen to him when he fell into the hands of the revolutionaries. He knew that in becoming monarch, that really any, any chance of happiness in his life was over. Power is never something to be sought. The minute you want the minute somebody is running for election, they want power. That's the last person you should vote for. It's one of the ridiculous things about democracy. You should never give power or to someone who wants it. Lord Nicholas did not want it. Um, and he knew that when he took it as, out of duty, that he realized that his life is pretty much over. It's constant work, uh, constant worry, constant fear. And as World War I breaks out, and as things begin to decay at home, 
he knew that it was going to be soon, it was going to be over. And he knew that the revolutionaries were not just going to kill them, but uh, the family, but torture them. Uh, the girls uh, were all sexually molested uh, by these Jews um, um, before, during, and after their execution in a ritual uh, kind of a way. The concept of the satanic here is the opposite of monarchy. The idea of the satanic is inversion. Up is down and down is up. Vulgarity rules. Envy. The lowest appetites. Monarchy is exactly the opposite. The highest virtues. The spiritual comes first. That you become um, a member of a royal house, you may have certain privileges. You could rarely enjoy them, but uh, in exchange for that, you give up your life. And you are always in the crosshairs, and you're aware of that. The thing about monarchy that makes it so different from democratic uh, politicians is that monarchies have to accept all responsibility, even when it's not their fault. They are ultimately to blame for everything that happens in society. And I don't care where you go in the world, monarchs always have that tendency. Democratic politicians do nothing but deflect blame. They usually don't know what's going on. They're just, you know, handmaidens of the economic elites who really matter. Um, but they, they often will, do, will never take responsibility for anything and will blame anybody around them. When the Duma opened in... Um, in, in Russian Empire after the revolution 1905-1906, you could see this in the most vile terms. The Duma uh, was elected, so to speak, by major media. They never campaigned on what they believed in. They simply uh, campaigned on what would get them elected. Often they had no real party affiliate. There were, were no parties. We kind of imposed party ideas on them, uh, and structures on them, but they didn't, they didn't view themselves that way. Uh, they usually lied about what they believed in. They were being paid by others. Uh, the press would invent ideas and impute it to people. The Russian press um, is far worse even than American press today. It was absolutely vile and disgusting. Um, the idea it was mostly yellow, muck, muckraking, generally speaking. You know, journalism was not considered a, a high occupation at the time. Only in, in our society can that kind of garbage be considered a, a high calling. Uh, the Duma um, would deliberately insult the royal family would block bills, would, would, would engage, you know, not only engage in, in terrorism or, or justify terrorism, but engage in it themselves. Whenever they, you know, they, they, if the monarch would give in to a demand, they would then double it the day later. Any excuse to foment revolution. It was an absolute disaster. Um, talking about the results of those elections is ridiculous. The press did not accurately summarize what these people believed in. The politicians themselves, um, uh, had no firm ideology. They tried to act like a peasant to the peasants. They acted like a Jew to the Jews. They just, you know, it was, there was no real, just like um, in 1990s in Russia, there was no ideology. Um, they were elected almost on total ignorance. And um, the press was heavily Jewish in Russia under Tsar Nicholas. The censorship was, was pretty much over uh, after 1905. And, um, and they, would, they would throw the most vile slanders at royalists and nationalists in Russia. They would accuse them of the most vile crimes, um, anything you know, at the time, like you know, molestation or homosexuality or all kinds of immorality. Um, and they were simply, simply invented. I mean, that, that was their extremely low reputation. And most of my listeners know what they did with Rasputin, trying to claim that they, they were, um, uh, he was a lover of, of, of Alexandra. Uh, nonsense like this. Uh, this is what the press did. And uh, people like Solzhenitsyn, Dostoevsky, Pope um, Ilin, you know, the press controls democracies. The press decides, and you know, the press is part of the corporate structure. The press decides what issues matter, what issues don't matter, what's an acceptable ideological position and what's extreme, what politicians are electable and which ones are not, uh, what's mainstream and what's extreme or, or out of the beyond the pale, so to speak. The press does all of this. Major media in all of its forms, they create the society. They create an artificial world and impose it upon the real one. And as the press gets more and more power uh, and they were more alienated from the society around them, 
and in that case, you know, very Jewish. As many of the major newspapers were, were Jewish in Russia at the time. Um, they created an entire dream world. And so you can't take a single election in those Dumas seriously in the least. I've read, you know, articles of dozens of, 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 of um, newspaper uh, uh, chains in, uh, in the Russian Empire and in the 20th century anyway. It was an absolute disaster. They made things up all the time. Tsar Nicholas, um, they, they claimed that um, um, the Russian-Japanese War, that millions of Russian soldiers were killed, that Russia was humiliated on the world stage, that Japan was taking over all of Siberia, that Tsar Nicholas um, deliberately threw the war, that he, he hated Russians and, and he wanted to destroy the country and hand it over to the Germans or to the Japanese or to somebody. Uh, they would invent the most ridiculous things over and over and over again. And over time, people began to believe this. And this is the disaster. And this is, this is what Elian says is, is the worst aspect of, of um, any kind of so-called free um, political system and one of the great benefits of, of monarchy. They impose uh, truth and reality on the, on the people. Now, Elin um, rests much of his thinking on three, what he calls three axioms of justice. And a lot of them, you know, we've already dealt with before, but this is a way to summarize them. Number one is the concept of dignity. This is the idea of self-respect in the sense we've already discussed. Self-government. A free man is not the one that could do whatever he wants. That's, that's you know, that's a meaningless concept. Um, you know, a pig wallowing in the mud is doing whatever it wants. That's, that's not absolute, absolute nonsense. Um, a, a dignified man is one that's um, self-governed, one that is autonomous, one that could look at a question without self-interest immediately, dragging his, his mind into, into all kinds of avenues that um, would not be entered into otherwise. Uh, the distortion of the world, if there's a financial interest or a sexual interest or something like that, the world is distorted, and you can't come to the truth that way. Uh, number two is... Um, We've mentioned already the concept of autonomy, that reason has to have boundaries, that reason comes after the facts of the case, the cultural background, the, the things that create a nation produces the material, the facts of the matter. Reason then comes secondly and arranges those things. Reason can never come first because reason has to have things to work upon. Reason is a tool. It's an essential part of human nature, only one part of it. Autonomy refers to reason and deliberation. If you are being controlled by some desire, some passion, you are not rational by definition. What happens then is that the reason becomes a slave of the passions. Reason is nothing more than a calculating machine. It, it figures out uh, uh, the best way to, to gain this kind of passion, the best way to steal money, come up with all kinds of schemes you know, the, the absolute twisted the destruction of, of the rational faculty. It has to be free of those kind of appetites before it could function at all. But the culture and tradition come first. Reason then is able to work on it and make sense out of it to work out the kinks in it. So in that case, autonomy, self-government, self-control, is also based on knowledge. There has to be a foundation in the truth and what is real which is very easily distorted when you are in the grip of some kind of passion. And finally, the third thing comes straight out of Hegel, and that is recognition. In Hegel, recognition is a technical term. It refers to the fact that who you are is not just some idiosyncratic self-definition, some weirdness, uh, you know, you identify as, as non-gender, something idiotic like that. Um, recognition refers to the fact that what you are is a part of the broader healthy society. Recognition is the basis of cooperation. It's the vocation that you have, your particular um, input to society, what you contribute is recognized as socially useful and you are recognized as uh, good at what you do. Only then do you become a real person. You can't just define yourself however you want. It has to be socially useful. It has to be beneficial. It has to be healthy. It has to be based on self-control and self-government. So recognition is a more technical term in this case. It's the idea that there can't be any isolated individuals. The initial term idiot 
refers to, well, it has the same root as idiosyncratic, to be outside of society, to be so, so useless that you are totally isolated and that you have nothing to do with the, the cooperative, the friendship that's necessary, the trust needed for, for the social whole to function. The word idiot is, is, is very specific in that sense. So you have the idea of dignity, which is similar to integrity, but not identical. The concept of autonomy and the idea of recognition and how that autonomy is being used uh, usefully as a part of the social whole. And of course, we assume that the society is generally healthy. Uh, society like the, the American has never existed before. This level of self-destruction, of, of just piggishness, has not existed up in the worst days of ancient pagan Rome. And ancient pagan Rome, at its worst, was utopia compared to what we have here. There is no mass media. There is no mass pornography being beamed at 12-year-olds. This is, you know, there, there are no bathroom debates and this kind of garbage. There is nothing remotely like the American society. It's so hard, even, even for those of us who have freed ourselves from it, to maintain that vigil vigilance necessary. We can hardly even understand what a healthy society is. I think that a lot of my people, you know, people on my side of the of, of, you know, political issues, still don't trust Putin, no matter what the man does. No matter what the man does, they don't trust him. And I think part of the reason for that is that they don't know what a healthy uh, leader is. That they're scared. That they, this guy can't be the real deal because everybody I know is corrupt. Everything I know is debased. You know, it's like um, if you're liberated from the gulag and you haven't had uh, decent food in 10 years, you don't, you don't go out and have a steak. You'll, you'll throw it up. Your body's not used to that. You have to slowly but surely. Get you, and this is our situation. You, know, you have somebody decent, someone healthy. Um, or one of the saints that, that was holy and, 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 a, and a man who could see into the future. You know, these people, throwing them into this society, they're, they're freaks. No one would know what to do with them. They'd be hated. They'd be killed. And so now they end up being hermits. Putin comes onto the world stage and, you know, well, far from perfect, is far superior to anything that the West has produced in a long time. And, um, and, 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 you know, so but a Westerner, say an American, who has never seen... Someone my age has probably never seen a healthy politician, a healthy statesman in their entire lives, except in history books. And someone like him comes onto the stage, or Lukashenko, someone like that. Um, we don't, we, 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 we're suspicious. Can such a person exist? You know, we're so bad off now that we think that, that real statesmanship is just mythical, that no one's really like that. We just idealize these people. I think that has a lot to do with it. And, and he, is, he is hated the way he is because he makes a mockery of the Western system. Then finally, we have to wrap this up quickly here, the axioms of power. The idea of the Constitution, first of all, is not something written down on paper. It's the nation in the way that we've defined it, how people communicate in the true sense of the word language. But number two, the idea that this Constitution is a foundation of law. It's never violence. I mean, if things have to be enforced through violence, society is already broken down. A law is a law because it's already accepted by the way that people have, have lived. The minute you have to use coercion all the time to enforce a law, the law is already illegitimate or foreign, some alien imposition. Number two. Number three, he defines natural law as that connection between human nature, those constant elements of human nature. What, what the human being always needs, that, that hierarchy of needs that every human being has in reason, connected with the specifics of the historical development of the nation that you belong to. There are no abstract people. Human nature can only go take you so far. Natural law can only take you so far. That human nature and human reason coexist with the facts of societal development. Number four, rights, duties, Contributions, recognition. These things are never individual. They are always social. They are always collective. Whether it be in society as a whole or in what particular function, uh, vocation, guild you belong to. It's always too well. This comes straight out of Hegel as well. The social whole is complicated. You know, we can never do everything. We have to specialize. We have to focus on something and become a part of the society only because. We focus in one thing. We could be policemen, we could be teachers, we could be uh, workers, we could be farmers. But we can't do all those things at the same time. And this is the nature of rights, that it falls into the specific contribution, the vocation, the guild, the syndicate, whatever you want to call it, 
uh, Hegel has it as a it's called the corporation in Hegel. He's referring to essentially a guild in his philosophy of writing. One of the most attractive elements in Hegel's thought, he had an entire syndicalist idea. That's where rights come from. That's where duties come from. It's to be found in those vocations, those roles in a society, and then, of course, how they contribute to the common good. Finally, the idea of justice. He defines justice as giving law, giving legal force to what we value and the meanings that we give to things. Human nature, the faith, all these things, they, they provide the baseline. You can't go beyond that or else you fall into pathology. You know, there is, you know, there, there's no relativism here. Human nature uh, provides the, the, um, the boundaries, the parameters necessary for any law, any, any meaning, any value. It can't go beyond that. Um, but how a society develops, how a nation develops, all those ingredients that we've already talked about, how a people become a people, when law is applied to that, when those things, they're always inchoate, you know, in the sense they're, they're never written down. They're too complex for that. But when we create a constitution in all senses of the term, all, all senses of the term constitution, you know, law, foundational law, as well as the way that society functions on a day-to-day -day basis, is that when Hegel used the word state, when Hegel uses the word state, he's referring to the nation and the constitution. So he's always using these terms in a way that we normally don't use them. We have to be very careful here. Justice is when a, a state or, or the formal ruling class of society gives legal sanction to what we consider valuable, what we consider true and good than the parameters of human nature and God's law. That is as far as I can go here. There is much, much more. Um, I will soon... Uh, give a podcast on Elin's approach to Hegel, which in my mind is one of the most important elements in political ideas over the last you know, 300 years. Hegel is the uh, nationalist, the royalist, the uh, guild socialist, so to speak. Um, everything that, that we value, that nationalists value, is to be found in Hegel's philosophy of right. But because he is so difficult to read, most people don't know that. Elin uh, takes the nationalist and royalist elements of Hegel and makes it the centerpiece of his thought. And his works on Hegel, his inter interpretation of Hegel, will be uh, coming up uh, soon in another podcast. Um, anyway, uh, I've overstepped my time here. I thank you for, for listening. I thank both my supporters and my detractors. Um, my detractors um, often have a tendency to, to go behind my back, uh, pretty much aware that taking me on, um, you know, face to face would be very unpleasant for them, intellectually speaking. Um, but I don't mind those who contact me and want to take me on uh, uh, through through writing. I only debate in writing because there you could think about it. You could you could think about your your answer. You could cite sources. You could actually you know focus on it. verbal debates are a problem because unless you have an immediate response, you look like an idiot. So it it rewards the most glib, not the most knowledgeable. So when I debate people, it's always in writing. It's always in a way that I can cite my sources and I can structure an answer in the most rational way possible. You can't do that in verbiage. But my detractors, to the extent that they are, you know, not, it's not just personal insults, they keep me on my toes. They keep me honest. And I appreciate that part of it. Constructive criticism, if you can't handle that, then you should get out of the field. And not, not all criticism is constructive. There's a lot of people who are just sick. And, um, you know, I, I, when I was younger, I, just, I wanted to throttle you people. But now I feel sorry for that, that crowd. There's something wrong with them. There's often substance abuse there. There's often abuse in general there. And um, I wish that, that you were able to just uh, come out of that, break out of that shell. Uh, anyway, I thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.